Hello everyone. So in this video, I am going to go over uh, molecular orbital theory applied to delocalized systems in organic molecules. Just as a reminder, uh, molecular orbitals, remember, um, considers the electrons to be occupying molecular orbitals in molecules, meaning that they are located in orbitals uh, which are spread over the volume of the entire molecule. So molecular orbitals are uh, results from the linear combination of atomic orbitals. In this uh, specific point here, I also like to remind you that uh, when we talk about linear combination of atomic orbitals, we are referring to mathematically combining the surrender solution for each of these atomic orbitals uh, and thus generating a new set of solutions, a new set of equations. So we are getting a quantitative number for the energy level of each molecular orbital. We are also getting information about the electronic density over each atom of the molecule and also about the geometry of the molecule. So as a basic rule to learn how to use a uh, uh, molecular orbital for organic molecules, we should know that combining n number of atomic orbitals will result in the same number of molecular orbitals, right? So we always uh, uh, get molecular orbitals by linearly combining atomic orbitals. So if we linearly combine three atomic orbitals, we will get three molecular orbitals and so forth. So when we get molecular orbitals, half of the resulting molecular orbitals uh, will be bonding and the other half will also will always be anti-bonding. This is when you get an even number of molecular orbitals, of course, right? So if you combine, for example, six, six atomic orbitals, you are expected to get six molecular orbitals. Three of them will be bonding and the remaining three will be anti-bonding. If the number of molecular orbitals that are resulting from the combination is an odd number, then you will have half of the uh, orbitals will be bonding molecular orbitals, the other half anti-bonding, and the remaining molecular orbital, we call it a non-bonding molecular orbital. Another thing that is very important to know when you're building molecular orbitals diagram is uh, it's important to know the number of nodes uh, that we have in all the orbitals. So the top orbital, the top molecular orbital will have a number of nodes that will equal the atomic orbitals combined minus one. And you should also know that the nodes are always symmetric in each molecular orbital, okay? So with these principles in mind, um, we can then go ahead and go over some examples of molecular orbital diagram for some uh, delocalized systems here. I'm going to start by this. Uh, this is not a delocalized system, as you should know now. It's an isolated double bond. So we only have two uh, sp2 atoms here next to each other. So we have two sp2 atoms. Each one has a p orbital. So uh, remember, we are focusing once again only into the pi bonds, the p, the pi electrons. Those are the electrons that are high in energy. Those are the electrons involved uh, in reactions. Everybody should know that below the, the molecular orbitals for the pi electrons, there are molecular orbitals with the sigma electrons. We are ignoring them, but you should know that they exist, right? So we have two p orbitals here for the pi bond. Therefore, combining two p orbitals should produce two molecular orbitals. One of them is bonding, and one of them is anti-bonding. So because we are combining two p orbitals, the top molecular orbital is expected to have now two minus one, which is one node. And now the bottom molecular orbital will obviously have zero nodes. Remember what a node is. So I'm going to write it over here. A node is an area of zero electron density. And they result from a change in the sign of the wave function. So we discussed before how electrons have wave-like properties. So they, uh, that's the foundation of all this, right? So a node is an area where, once again, uh, there is zero electron density. And also, a node is um, the result of uh, a change in the sign of the wave function. So 
everybody should then be able to identify nodes in orbitals. So in this uh, first orbital for this double uh, alkene molecule, there are no nodes, meaning there is no sign change on, of the sign of the wave function. You can see how the shading on top is the same. So same sign of the wave function. Shading on the bottom is the same. Same uh, sign of the wave function. So zero nodes here. And then in the following uh, hiding energy molecular orbital, we have one node. Uh, once again, a node is the result of uh, a, a change in the sign of the wave function. The node will be right here. You can see how there is two uh, lobes here with different signs of the wave function. That's a node. Uh, same happened over here on the bottom. So this molecular orbital has one node. Since we have two molecular orbitals, the hiding energy is the anti-bonding. There is an anti-bonding interaction here. Whenever you have a node, you will have also anti-bonding interactions. And the lowering energy has no nodes, so there is no anti-bonding interaction whatsoever. So in a pi bond, we have two electrons, so we need to fill out our molecular orbital diagram here. So we fill from bottom to top, placing two electrons per orbital. So we place two electrons in this orbital, and that's it, because that's the total number of electrons. So this will be the molecular orbital diagram for this double bond. So one thing that I also want to introduce here is the, the concept of uh, frontiers molecular orbitals. Um, and the frontier molecular orbitals are uh, the HOMO, which means the highest occupied molecular orbital, and the LUMO. which is the lowest on occupied molecular orbital. Why do we care so much? Once again, uh, these are the higher energy orbital in the case of the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital. So for a molecule giving electrons in a reaction, those electrons will always be in the HOMO orbitals because these are the electrons that are less tightly held by this molecule. For a molecule accepting electrons, it will also always use the LUMO to accept these electrons since that will be the empty orbital lowering energy, right? So that's uh, every reaction in between two organic molecules when you analyze them um, based on molecular orbital theory, uh, they go through HOMO-LUMO reactions. So the HOMO is always going to be for the electron donor. reacting with the LUMO who will always be the electron acceptor. There are some other things to consider when you're talking about the reactions based on frontier molecular orbitals, like the symmetry of the HOMO and the LUMO, uh, they must match. Uh, you will see that in Organic 2 later on. The important thing for you to know right now is that once again, molecules Donating electrons will donate those will contribute to this new bond with the HOMO. Molecules accepting electrons will use the LUMO to accept those electrons. The closer in energy a HOMO of one molecule and the LUMO of another molecule, the more likely the reaction is to happen. Okay, so uh, so that's for an isolated double bond. So let's go to see now uh, the first example of a delocalized system. As I said before, the localized system are uh, those organic molecules having three uh, sp2 atoms, three or more sp2 atoms next to each other. So here we have one sp2 carbon, another sp2 carbon, and the third uh, carbon here, which is a carbocation, we always uh, consider that it's an sp2 carbon as well. So we have three sp2 carbons, therefore we have three p orbitals, one in each carbon. This p orbital, remember, is empty. That is a p orbital here, and there is a p orbital here for this pi bond. Okay? So if we combine them, because once again, we are focusing only on the pi electrons, we are focusing only in the p orbitals, we are ignoring the sigma bonds. So we combine three, total of three p orbitals, because that's what we have in these molecules one here, one here, one here. So if we combine three p orbitals, we are expecting to get three molecular orbitals, 
the top molecular orbital will have three minus one, which is two, two nodes. Therefore, the one below will have one, and the one below will have zero nodes. And we have to consider once again that nodes are always symmetric. Okay, so in level uh, zero, so here it is, we have no nodes here, no change in the sign of the wave function. You see the shading for the three lobes on top is the same. The shading for the three lobes on the bottom is the same. So all interactions here are bonding interactions, are constructive interactions. So this is what we consider the molecular orbital, the pi molecular orbitals with zero nodes. In the next molecular orbital, we have one node. Uh, again, we have three atoms here, one carbon, another carbon, and another carbon because nodes are symmetric and there is one. That node must be right here in the carbon, which is in the middle, carbon, carbon number two. That's exactly where the node is gonna be. I'm not showing the lobe here because remember the node is an area of zero electron density. Therefore, we cannot show uh, the picture of the orbital here since there is zero electron density. So there are never is gonna be electron density found in this area. Um, so the signs uh, of the wave function is different. So I'm gonna turn this around here to show once again that there is once again a anti-bonding interaction on top and there is an anti-bonding interaction on the bottom and it is once again making the node right in the middle, okay? So this, this is how a molecular orbital for three atoms having one node will look like. And then the next molecular orbital having two nodes, nodes being symmetric. So obviously one must be here and the second one must be here. And in order to have a node here, we must have different shading on top and to have one here, different shading over here, same thing on the bottom. So two anti-bonding interactions here, one anti-bonding interaction here. So this is the molecular orbital diagram for any any molecule or ion having three p orbitals next to each other. Um, now we need to think uh, uh, for the allylic carbocation specifically, how many pi electrons do we have? So we have a pi bond here, the pi bond is two electrons. Uh, the p orbital is empty, so the total number of electrons here is two. So we place these two electrons in the first and the lower energy molecular orbital. And this is it. So this could be the molecular orbital diagram for the allylic carbocation. So one of the things that is important for you guys is to really understand how uh, do we interpret the information from a molecular orbital diagram? How can we use this information for in a class of organic chemistry? Um, so what this means is uh, in, the, in the bonding molecular orbital, we have the two electrons of the allylic carbocation, uh, and this is the homo, okay? Now we have the next orbital, the non-bonding orbital in this case is the LUMO, it's the lowest orbital which is empty. And in this orbital, uh, there, there is, uh, if there were electrons, now we have none, those electrons will be found only in carbon one and three. There will never be electron density in this orbital in carbon two. Right now it's empty because there, is, there are only two electrons in this allylic carbocation. So the allylic carbocation is an electron deficient uh, ion. Obviously the carbocation, this carbon has six electrons in the valence shell. That's why it's positively uh, charged. It needs two electrons to complete eight. So because of that, uh, you guys, should know at this point that carbocations are very strong electrophiles. So uh, electrophiles are species that are electron deficient. So this carbon will be uh, reacting as an electron acceptor because it's an electrophile, right? So if, it's, if the allylic carbocation is reacting as an electron acceptor, since it's an electrophile, which orbital will be using? The LUMO, okay? So that would be the orbital participating in the reaction because this is the orbital that is ready to accept two electrons. The one below is full. And in this orbital, um, there can only be electron density on carbon one and on carbon three. So what we can uh, interpret out of this is that when a nucleophile or a species rich in electrons approaches this electrophile, 
it will approach the electrophile of either carbon-1 or carbon-3. Never the, the nucleophile ever will approach it at carbon-2. Why? Because there is a node in carbon-2 of the LUMO. And in the node, there is zero electron density. So according to the molecular orbital picture, because the allylic carbocation is an electrophile, according to molecular orbital theory, the LUMO would be the orbital used for this ion polar reaction. And therefore, only carbon-1 and carbon-3 will receive a nucleophilic attack because there is a node in carbon-2. I'm showing you here the resonance structures of the allylic carbocation so you can compare molecular orbital theory and resonance theory. Uh, once again, according to the resonance structures, the positive charge in an allylic carbocation is shared in between carbons 1 and 3, right? There is no electron deficiency in carbon 2, as you can see in this resonance structure. So the hybrid of these two are shows delocalization all over the three carbons and electron deficiency in carbon 1 and in carbon 3. So according to the resonance theory, this carbocation, which is electron deficient, will receive a nucleophilic attack at either C1 or C3, which is exactly what we concluded right now out of the molecular orbital analysis of the allylic carbocation. Next, I'm showing here the allylic radical. The allylic radical, remember, the only difference is that this carbon here has an unpaired electron. That's why we call it a radical. It's allylic because it has a pi bond next to it, right? So um, a, a, a carbon, radical carbon, is always sp2 hybridized. Remember, trigonal planar, and this unpaired electron is in the p orbital that is perpendicular to the plane of the molecule. So the total number of p orbitals in an allylic radical is once again three, one here and one here, so each sp2 atom, so two, and there is a third p orbital here containing the unpaired electrons. So three p orbitals next to each other, this is a delocalized system, therefore three produce three, so the same diagram as before, so combining three atomic orbitals produces three molecular orbitals, the top will have three minus one, which is two nodes. So this one will have one node and this one is zero node. Um, because nodes are symmetric, so in the orbital having, the non-bonding orbital having one node is right here in the center. And the anti-bonding orbital having two nodes have these two nodes over here. So the total number of electrons for an allylic radical is two electrons in the pi bond and one electron in the radical, so that's a total of three electrons. So we're gonna fill our molecular orbital diagram. So two electrons will be coming here. And then the third electron is gonna be up here. So that could be the molecular orbital diagram for the allylic radical. So analyzing the uh, MOT diagram here in regards to the reactivity of an allylic radical. Once again, this carbon has seven electrons in the valence shell. Therefore, it needs to accept an extra electron to complete eight. Basically, it's an electron deficient carbon as well. If you look at the MOT diagram, accepting electrons, so there is the lowest orb orbital which can accept electrons is here, okay? Therefore, uh, in this orbital, which is the one that the allylic radical will be using for a reaction since it's once again electron deficient, uh, the extra electron can only be accepted in carbon one or in carbon three, since these are the two carbons having um, electron density over them. Uh, there is a node right over, uh, over carbon number two, meaning that the electron will never uh, approach carbon two. I am showing you here the resonance structures of the allylic radical, same thing as the allylic carbocation. The only thing that you want to make sure you write correctly, the, remember this is, these are half arrows because we are indicating that on the flow of only one electron 
So one electron of the double bond is flowing over here to make a new pi bond. And then the second electron of the double bond is coming here to form another radical. The real structure is a hybrid of these two. Remember, none of these exist, meaning that in the real structure, in the hybrid of this, there is radical character over carbon one, and there is radical character over carbon three, meaning that carbon one and three will be the ones accepting the extra electron to complete eight electrons in the valence shell. And that is exactly what we just concluded before out of molecular orbital theory. Okay, so this would be the orbital used for reactions of the allylic radical in these orbitals, only uh, carbon one and carbon three have coefficients over them. Okay. So next I have the allylic carbon ion. So once again, allylic systems, guys, is uh, a charge or an unpaired electron next to a double bond, right? When the charge is positive, it's allylic carbocation. If it is an unpaired electron, it's allylic radical. If it is a uh, lone pairs of electrons, that's the allylic carbonion. This carbon is negatively charged. Um, uh, I am not going to get into discussing the hybridization of this carbon. Okay, you'll do that in organic too. But for now, uh, the important thing is in the allylic carbon ions, these two electrons are delocalized also here. So it's two electrons next to a double bond. Uh, so this delocalization uh, is what uh, we really care for. Therefore, if we're gonna draw the molecular orbital diagram, we are considering three atomic orbitals, one here, one here, and one here. Combining three atomic orbitals leads to three molecular orbitals. The top molecular orbital having three minus one, two nodes, symmetric both of them. The one below, one node right in the middle, and the one lowering energy having no nodes. You see the shading the same on both above and below the plane of the of the orbital, exactly where we did for carbocations, the allylic carbocation and the allylic radical. So the next question is how many pi electrons we are considering here. So we have two electrons on the pi bond and there is a lone pair on the on the negatively charged carbons. So that's a total of four electrons to place in our molecular orbital diagram. So we're gonna place two here and the next two, we're gonna place it over here. So the allylic carbon ion, as you can see, is a carbon that is, uh, it has excess of electron density over it. So it's an electron rich carbon. We call this, as you should know, a nucleophile. It's electron rich. Remember that nucleophiles, according to molecular orbital theory, will react with the homo orbital. Okay, so the homo orbital is, is this, uh, is the highest occupied molecular orbital. Uh, therefore, in this orbital, you can see that these two electrons are, uh, there is electron density accounting for these two electrons over carbon one and over carbon three. Zero electron density on carbon two, meaning that uh, the allylic carbocation, when it reacts, it will react uh, at positions one or at position three because it is a nucleophile and it will be reacting with a homo orbital. Okay? So I'm going to label this just in case so everybody remember this is the homo orbital and this would be the lumo. And uh, I'm going to color code this in, in red so everybody remember that the HOMO will be the orbital used for reaction by this allylic carbon ion. So next I'm showing here a system with uh, four carbons. Uh, this carbon is sp2, therefore it has one p orbital, this one as well, this one as well, and this one as well. So we have four sp2 carbons next to each other. Therefore, this is indeed a delocalized system. So if we're going to draw the molecular orbitals for this molecule, we are once again only focusing on the pi bonds, the pi electrons, and the electrons that are delocalized, those are the ones hiding energy. So we will be combining four p orbitals, and the combination of four p orbitals will produce four molecular orbitals, as we know. The top molecular orbital, once again, will have four minus one, three nodes. So three areas of antibonding interactions. 
So this area must be symmetric. So that's one anti-bonding interaction here, one anti-bonding interaction here, and one anti-bonding interaction here. So that accounts for three nodes that are symmetric. The one below must have two nodes, three, two. Uh, once again, these two nodes must be symmetric. And the way to do it here is uh, there would be an anti-bonding interaction in between carbons one and two, and sorry, three and four. And there would be an anti-bonding interaction also in between carbons one and two. Okay, so one anti-bonding interaction here, one node, one anti-bonding interaction here, one node, that's two nodes symmetric. The one below has only one node, so just one anti-bonding interaction to make it symmetric. That node must be right here in the middle of the four carbons. The anti-bonding interaction is here in between carbons two and three. Okay. And the lowest energy molecular orbital is a zero node. You see how the shading is the same for all of them. Zero anti-bonding interaction. All are bonding interactions, same shading. Now, the next thing, so we have already the symmetry of the and the molecular orbitals for this uh, one, three butadiene for four p orbitals next to each other. The next question is how many pi electrons do we have? So we have one pi bond here, that's two electrons and another pi bond here, another two electrons. That's a total of four electrons. So we are gonna uh, place two electrons in the lowest energy molecular orbital and another two electrons in the following molecular orbital. So therefore, uh, this could be the homo of the molecule and this one here will be the lumo, okay? I'm not gonna get into which uh, orbital is this molecule using for reaction, but you can imagine how this is a likely source of electrons. So most likely you should think about this behaving as a nucleophile. So it might be a reaction with a homo orbital, which looks like this. And I'm showing you here the, the resonance structures for butadiene. Uh, so you can flow the electrons uh, to the right. Uh, remember the total charge of every resonance structure must always be the same. Total charge here is zero as here. Or you can do the reverse. I did the color coding here, red and blue, so you can see how the electrons are flowing. Uh, I'm, I'm just realizing that this is, I'm sorry, let me correct this. Um, so if I'm flowing the electrons toward the other side, the positive charge is gonna be actually in the other end. So let me correct that. That's that. So guys, the point here is that uh, the, the highest contributor uh, structure, once again, is this one, since it has the larger number of, of covalent bonds, consider sigma and pi both, right? So this is the highest contributor, meaning that the real structure resembles more this structure. In this other two, you have unlike charges. And if you look at this specific structure, you can see how in this one is indicating that there is an electron deficiency in this carbon, and this one indicates the opposite. So really, uh, there is no, um, it's hard to tell that you have electron deficiency on all electron density uh, excess in the end carbon, since they were kind of, kind of cancel out, as you can see. But what you can definitely uh, interpret out of this um, structures is that there is double bond character between carbon two and three in both of them, okay? So that accounts for the delocalization over here, all right? So uh, once again, if you were to consider, and you will do this in organic two reaction with butadiene, uh, here is how the homo looks like. So this could be the orbital that butadiene will use for donating electrons. And then finally, I'm bringing here now an extra example where we have uh, the pentadienyl cation, so this carbon is sp2, has one pure p orbital. This carbon is sp2 as well, has another p orbital. The next is a carbocation that as everybody should know, uh, carbocations are obviously sp2 hybridized, so there is another empty, this one is empty p orbital here. Next we have another sp2 carbon, so this is another p orbital. And then we have another sp2 carbon, so that's another p orbital. So this is a delocalized system having one, two, three, four, five p orbitals, 
right? So there is delocalization over this entire area of the molecule. So to build the molecular orbitals of the pentadienyl cation, we need to linearly combine five p orbitals. So that will lead to five, three, four, five molecular orbitals. The top molecular orbital will have five minus one, four nodes. So four regions of anti-bonding interactions. They must be symmetric. So there is an anti-bonding interaction here. There is an anti-bonding interaction here, another one here, and another one here. So that's four anti-bonding interactions, all symmetric. So that's how the top orbital will look like. The one below in energy will have three anti-bonding interactions. So that's one here, one here. So this node, watch out, this node is right in the third carbon in this orbital. And then there is an anti-bonding interaction in between these two carbons over here, right? So three nodes, one here in between these two carbons, one in the third carbon in the carbon in the middle, and another in between these two carbons of the other end. The orbital below that will have now only two nodes. Nodes must be symmetric. Therefore, this could be in carbon two and carbon four, right, right over the carbons. That's where the nodes will be. So we have one anti-bonding interaction here and another one over here, that's two, which is what this orbital has. The one below will have only one anti-bonding interaction. So that means that in order for that anti-bonding interaction to be symmetric, this should be right over carbon number three. Okay, so the anti-bonding interaction is right here. So whenever you see two lobes that are next to each other, with uh, different shading, that's an anti-bonding interaction, right? So this is, and this obviously in the lowest energy will have no anti-bonding interaction. So all the shades are the same, meaning all interactions are bonded. That's why it's the lowest energy orbital. So if we are gonna then fill out this molecular orbital diagram, we need to think how many pi electrons. So we have a pi bond here, so that's two electrons. We have a p orbital here that is empty, so zero electrons here, so that total continues to be two. And we have another pi bond here, that's another two, so two on two is four. So I'm gonna add here two electrons in the lowest energy molecular orbital, and then another two electrons in the, in the subsequent uh, molecular orbital, that's four electrons, okay? So this would be then the homo orbital for the pentadienyl cation. And this one would be the LUMO, so the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So these are the frontier orbitals for the pentadienyl cation. So if I think about reactions of this, uh, of this ion in terms of molecular orbitals, first thing that I need to know is is it an electrophile or a nucleophile? Obviously, it's a carbocation. It's highly electron deficient, so it's a very strong electrophile. And as we should also know at this point, electrophiles, according to molecular orbital theory, will always be using the LUMO because that's the lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals, so the molecular orbital that can accept electrons, which is lowering energy. And if we look at the symmetry of the LUMO here for the pentadienyl cation, you can see how uh, when the pentadienyl cation, according to molecular orbital theory, when it accepts electron to complete the valence of the carbon, these electrons will be accepted either are carbon one, carbon three, or carbon five. Why? Because once again, there is zero electron density in carbon four and zero electron density in carbon two. Okay, so pentadienyl cation electrophile, therefore it must be using the LUMO, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, and the symmetry of the LUMO shows that only carbon one, three, and five will be accepting electrons to uh, in a reaction with a nucleophile. I am showing you here also the resonance structures for the pentadienyl cation. You can see how 
If you flow the pi electrons here to the right, you'll get the positive charge in this carbon, and from the, the other side, you get it on the other end carbon. The real structure is a hybrid of these three with electron deficiency in carbon one, carbon three, and carbon five. Okay, so in the hybrid of this molecule, uh, we have delocalization over the entire area of the molecule. I tried to draw the, the hybrid of this molecule so you can see how it looks like. And this delocalization shows that um, there is electron deficiency on, so I'm showing the localization here. So that shows that this entire, these pi electrons are delocalized over the entire section of the molecule. And, and then now we need to show the electron deficiency that we have in the three carbons, carbons one, three, and five. So, so we have a fraction of positive charge over carbon one, over carbon three, and over carbon five. Meaning that once again, uh, because it's an, a strong electrophile, it will be reacting with nucleophiles. So a nucleophile here, which is on a species rich in electrons, will be attacking these carbocations at positions one, three, or five. Okay, because once again, those are the carbons showing electron deficiency in the hybrid structure of this molecule. Okay. And this is exactly, exactly what we just concluded when we were talking about the molecular orbitals diagram. Okay, so I'm, let me finish showing the curve outers here. So we're attacking a carbon one, or the nucleophile could also attack carbon five, because it's also electron deficient, or it could attack carbon three, okay? One, three, and five, and this is exactly what we concluded out of the symmetry of the LUMO orbital, which is the one that this uh, pentadienyl cation will be using for a reaction according to the frontiers molecular orbitals, okay? So with that, I'm finalizing these videos. I hope you guys understood, and uh, thank you, everybody.